Hello, my name is Emma Skye and I'm director of Yale World Fellows and co-host of the Good Society Forum. The Good Society Forum is a community of change makers around the world with a common quest to build the good society. My co-host is Nizama Dean of the Prince's Trust and a 2019 Yale World Fellow. Niz. Thank you, Emma. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Good Society Forum webinar. You are very welcome. Um, we are delighted that you are part of our, by virtue of joining, you are now part of our community. That's how easy it is to join. So thank you very much for being part of our community. Um, we've had a number of brilliant sessions on how to build a good society in a post-COVID world, and today is no exception. Um, to find out more about what we have got planned, we would love for you to join our community online as well as being here in person. We have a Twitter account at Good Society at Good Sock Forum. We're on LinkedIn at Good Society Forum. We're also on Facebook. Uh, those links will be on the chat function. Please do have a look. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Brilliant. Uh, and if you are interested in participating in the Good Society Forum or if you have ideas about what potential subjects we should be covering, please do let us know. You can either get in touch via the social media channels or you can also email us at info at goodsocietyforum.com. Now we have a tradition whenever we start to see just where our uh, webinar attendees are from. So there should be a chat function just below in front of your screen. Uh, some, of, some, some regulars have already started. If you could just type in the city that you're typing in from, please don't be shy. And we want to say hello. Um, Emma, do you want to have a crack and say this? Well, we've got Michelle Rentenar, of course, from Brussels. We've got Yazid from New York. Oh, Nikita from New Hi, York. Hi, Nikita. Bill from London. Josh from New Haven. We have Emily from Bonnie, Scotland. Hi. We have Corey John from, from France. Jose from, from Mexico. Mehmet from Ann Arbor. Mm. Daji from Abidjan. Hi, Daji. Great to see you. Alex, Alex Munoz from Chile. <laughs> from Chile. Hey, brilliant. Great to see you. And we have Amelia from Ghana. Uh, we have someone from Barcelona, Spain. We have Ali from Vienna by virtue of Erbil. Uh, and Brian from Basking Ridge, New Jersey. This is brilliant. Um, Tina from Kingston. I'm wondering if that's Kingston, Jamaica, or Kingston, uh, Southwest. Uh, London. Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> we have Gabriella from Buenos Aires. Brilliant. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and Milan from Washington, D.C. Uh, thank you. Um, fantastic. Uh, uh, Claudia Guzman from Peru and quarantine in New Jersey. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. And Tina, thank you for clarifying. It's Kingston, Jamaica. That's fantastic. Another, mm -hmm. another continent to add. I think we've, we've broadly covered the whole world with our attendees. Uh, thank you so much. So Emma, what's our, what's our webinar about today? Well, the pandemic is changing how people view the role of the state and the market as an efficient means for generating prosperity and even democracy as a political system. Some governments have risen to the challenge, notably democratic ones led by women, but others have not. And the pandemic has exposed the limitations of our existing economic systems, where the focus on efficiencies left little resilience and increased inequalities. For our democracies to work, we need a collective commitment to building better societies. Now much needs fixing and to change the system, you need strategy, resources and action. And you need allies who share your vision. You need to build coalitions. But how do you win elections in the post-COVID environment when we're heading into a recession and when populists and authoritarians are gaining greater popularity? So today we are joined by three leaders from Peru, Ukraine and the United States. Now our first guest is Julio Guzman and Julio is running to be president of Peru in 2021. He is the leader and founder of the Partido Morado, the Purple Party, which is a centrist political national party 
which holds nine seats in Congress. And he ran for president in the 2016 elections and was in second place before he was excluded due to administrative issues regarding the registration of his candidacy. Now, previously, Julio was a partner at Deloitte Peru. He served as vice minister of industry and small and medium enterprises and as secretary general at the office of the prime minister. Before joining the government, Julio worked for a decade at the Inter-American Development Bank and is a 2018 Yale World Fellow. Julio, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Emma. Thank you all. Uh, I would like to thank the Good Society Forum for this opportunity. I really think I'm going to learn more because I would like to understand what is going on uh, around the world. But in this, uh, this time, I'm going to speak about what I see in Peru about the pandemic and how campaigning is going gonna, is, is gonna to be different in the, in, in the near future. Uh, in order to understand campaigning, we need to first uh, take a look at what is the effect of the pandemic on, on the people. And I believe that the most important one, aside health issues and economic issues, is the emotional impact. We have uh, been through an emotional shock, particularly in Peru, that we have been growing 17 years. 17 years, the economy has been grown, uh, creating a very interesting middle class. And now the middle classes are, think, are, are thinking, I couldn't believe that I was so vulnerable. That this is one of the time in which Peruvian, we are aware about our vulnerability, but not as a country as a whole, but in our own family. And this has created anxiety, but other kinds of, on, of sensations. For, uh, for instance, fear, fear, distrust. It's, it's really interesting, but uh, when in Peru, uh, something bad happened, people united. But now when the virus, uh, with the virus, people are keeping apart. So this is a completely new thing that the first impact is an, an emotional impact. And I also will say that uh, one of the consequences of what's going on in Peru is that people will start thinking differently. For instance, entrepreneurship, individualism, uh, uh, risk tendency, uh, those kinds of Western values. I really believe that progressively, people are gonna think differently. Uh, thinking about collective action, uh, thinking about that planning is much better. Uh, thinking that simplicity and austerity maybe could be the next uh, uh, values. So this is really important. We are not only through a change in the states and the public services, but I really believe that this is a transition of how people think and how people think about themselves and how people think about their own values in the daily uh, base. So uh, taking that and talking about that, the next question is, what is the political demand behind this emotion? Because this emotion is creating new demands so the social, economic, but particularly political demands. In my opinion, what is, gonna, what is going on, what is gonna happen in Peru is that people, once they have realized the limitations of the health system, the limitations of the labor market, the inexistence of social safety nets, Peruvians are gonna demand a new social contract. I really believe that Peruvians are gonna ask for a completely different kind of state, a new contract with Peruvians that went directly to the well-being of the families and the human being, an approach that is not only economical approach, but particularly a human approach. Um, one of the things that are gonna be behind this demand for a new social contract is, the, is inequality and injustice. I really believe that uh, those terms are gonna be at the center of the political debate. Peru is a very unequal country and Latin America too. But I really believe that the, one of the impacts is that injustice and inequality are gonna be at the center of the political debate. And it's gonna happen the following. Um, there are gonna be proposals like could be very controversial, like the ba uh, basic income for, uh, for all or maybe taxing the rich uh, uh, you know, in different ways. But this is only the manifestation of people who are realizing that inequality is behind everything. There are a couple of, of new concepts uh, in, 
in the near, near fu future. The first of all is uh, the new uh, understanding about the state. I, I believe that people are gonna put more value on the state now than before. Why? Because they have realized that the state intervention during the pandemic has had some results. In Peru, for instance, in Peru, for instance, the state intervention has been huge in the last two months. The government has intervened in giving uh, financial uh, uh, health credits, massive credit, uh, credits to the small and medium uh, companies, but also uh, uh, cash transfers, for instance, and subsidies. So what is going on is that uh, people, Peruvians, are going to realize that the state is not the is not the problem, but the state could be the solution in terms of what they have seen uh, now. And the other concept that is going to change is the approach about markets. It's that we believe that markets uh, assign, you know, the resources to the more uh, productive activities. And now we are uh, we are realizing that markets are not uh, giving the real value to people in Peru. Essential workers essential people who are really uh, uh, taking the country up are you know, drivers, uh, nurses, uh, police officers, who are exactly the people who we discriminated all the time and are exactly the same people who are the more vulnerable now under the pandemic. So the sense of markets also, I think it's gonna change. Um, in conclusion, uh, campaigning, Campaigning in the next months will have uh, three key factors, in my opinion. The first one is that it's going to be more emotional. Of course, uh, political campaigns are emotional always, but I believe that in this case, it's going to be a little bit different. It's not only more intensity on that emotion, but it's going to be a fight between fear, between frustration, and hope. And that's one of the risks that we are going to face. The second factor that I believe is going to be very important is about the proposals. People are going to expect proposals that they understand, proposals that could be simple, proposals that could be universal, and proposals that could affect their own family. This is different because in the past we have seen candidates talking about reforms in general, you know, changes in, in public entities, the creation of new programs. This is no longer be successful. I really believe that in the next months, who is gonna be successful is the candidate and the political party who propose very specific solutions to family problems that could be universal, as I said, and not targeted only for the poor. And the third factor that is gonna be very important is about the tendency of, the, of Peruvians uh, for, author, for author, authoritarianism and populism. And that's very risky. And why? Because uh, they, are, they have fear, they are uh, anxious, they are frustrated. So they're gonna be attracted by people who offer authority, but also promises that maybe cannot be achieved. So I, in conclusion, I, I think that the campaigning in Peru, uh, it's gonna be not about corruption, it's not gonna be about security, but it's gonna be about democracy, versus populism. And that's, that's the challenge that we need to face. And in Partido Morado, our responsibility is to do both. I think there is no divorce. There is no, uh, a lack of complement between being responsible and being a Democrat and believe in the rule of law and at the same time offer people solutions that they can understand and they can change their own lives. So that's our challenge and that's what we're working on. Finally, I would like to, um, to assess, I would like to present to you some of the reforms that I believe will be behind this new uh, approach. If, uh, if I don't have the time, I will leave the reforms for the questions, but I'm gonna start. First of all, when I'm talking about a new social contract, I'm talking about a, a very basic national accord there should be a national agreement based on not 10 issues, but only two, like uh, education, democracy, but there should be a national agreement. The second thing is that that national agreement should be supported by a, by a very profound structural reforms. Latin America and Peru uh, uh, went through a, 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 
a structural reform in the 90s. But those structural reforms were like the, like the first class re reforms. Now we need a second kind of reforms. What kind of reforms, of reforms could be? First of all, we need to make a tax reform. We cannot say that we are going to offer a new social contract based on solutions for families and people if we don't have the money to fund it. And one of the things uh, that we need to change in Peru is the tax system, which really unequal. In Peru, labor pays more taxes than capital. It's incredible. But at the same time, there are a lot of exceptions in the tax system. The second uh, reform that I believe is really important is the financial reform. In Peru, nobody wants to touch the financial system because it's sacred. It's the free market. And now, because of what happened in the pandemic, the state intervened, giving credit to medium uh, companies, and has been successful. And nothing happened with the market. So the second is financial reform. We need to, to understand that the state, in, in sometimes, and in some spaces, need to intervene to give more credit to people. The third is education and health. Julio, if yes. I may. My, my apologies, I'm just conscious that we, 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 we want to hear from you. These are incredible insights. Um, would you mind if we picked this up during the Q&A section and just allowed our other two speakers to come in, offer some of their thoughts and ideas, and also to start encouraging our attendees who I know will have lots of uh, questions and, and prompts from what you've already said. So if I could say thank you for that opening, um, incredible, insightful, um, uh, uh, or, or, I mean, I mean, wisdom, I guess, is, is the best way for me to describe it um, in, in terms of campaigning in the post-COVID world. Um, and I will uh, introduce our next speaker, um, who I'm delighted to introduce. Our next speaker is Elena Sotnik. Elena is a Ukrainian politician, lawyer, and human rights defender. Elena was one of the protesters, uh, protesters in, in Maidan during the revolution. It was this experience that led Elena to go into politics. She was a member of parliament, held prominent positions in the working bodies of several international organizations, including the Council of Europe, and focused on issues including Euro integration of Ukraine and female empowerment. Elena has been an outspoken voice against Russian aggression and is a 2019 Yale World Fellow and a fellow fellow. Elena, we would love to hear from you. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for just inv inviting me. And if I just can be a little bit emotional, I want to say to all my fellows from to, to 2019, I miss you so much. I think uh, it was a main challenge for us, I mean, for our group, because we've been so happy and it was perfect and safe time. And immediately we came back home. Uh, the COVID crisis began. So um, sometimes it's very helpful just to remember about our perfect days together. So guys, hi, and it's nice to see you. But uh, at the same time, life uh, is not going to finish after the COVID. It's going to be just a little bit different. And uh, why it's important to talk about democracy? Because from the very beginning, we believe that we have some basic uh, uh, challenges and basic things to deal with, like health care, like uh, economy issues. But in the very end of the day, it is everything about democracy, because effective decisions they are coming from uh, effective leadership and from effective uh, people who can cope with this crisis situation. So uh, my feeling is that we are going to have the main challenge this year and maybe even the next one with elections and of course with campaigning and uh, of course with the agenda of politicians. So that's why I want to stop on three main issues. The first one, it is a legitimate or a legitimate choice um, because I don't believe that in this situation uh, we have any chance to be mistrusted uh, with the choice or mistrusted with the politicians because otherwise it will be a collapse of all state system and uh, they have a little bit different point of view uh, than Julio uh, but I'm going to switch to the role of state in the end of my speech. The second one uh, issue which is also very important of course rules and procedures 
uh, during the electoral uh, campaign, during the voting day, because we need to provide people both with effective system, which they are going to trust, but at the same time with a safe system, uh, because COVID is still there. And I think that the second wave will be definitely on in uh, autumn when many elections all over the world is going to uh, be. And the last one, of course, it's campaigning and uh, politician agenda. And uh, there I'm, I'm going to elaborate less because Julio have been talking about this a lot, but also will just express my opinion. Just a small, uh, you know, example from my real life. So this Monday we've been trying to film um, first video of our uh, political initiative. And because in my country, uh, there is limitation to stay in, the, in a group more than eight people. We've been so lucky with my partners uh, from new political group that we've been seven. Otherwise, we couldn't film this anyway. So uh, this video wouldn't be possible and we couldn't show it uh, today when we have uh, anniversary of our president Zelensky. It is a, it's one year since he became president. So, you know, it is small things, very technical things, but uh, they are really limiting your ability to campaign and your ability to build your promotions. And I think that uh, more and more limitations we are going to meet next uh, months and next weeks. But let me uh, start from the um, trust and, uh, of course, results of any elections. Um, first of all, uh, I believe that in any case, with any conditions, even during the pandemic, elections should be held because it is a matter of trust uh, to the authorities. It is a matter of, uh, I would say, stability of any state. The second one, uh, elections should be safe. As I told you, because uh, no way people uh, uh, would be, uh, for example, infected during the uh, elect election uh, campaign or in, uh, during the vote day. So it means that our politicians now they should take some decisions and change the rules. For example, you can uh, look through the previous experiences of some uh, countries and also, for example, United States, where they used uh, mailing uh, or they used uh, very interesting uh, uh, thing like uh, um, drive through voting. It is almost like McDonald's uh, drive, uh, drive, uh, um, but uh, you know, you just using your car and you're voting from your car and you are not connected to the people. So you're more or less safe. And it was interesting experience. I've been um, discovering uh, it uh, on TV. It, it, was, it, it was very nice. Also, of course, um, it can be uh, absentee ballots or uh, you can use uh, some kind of digital programs uh, in order to vote from the distance. And the main issue, of course, to provide security and trust to these technologies. Um, and the second one that they are not going to be hacked, they are not going to be manipulated, other things. But at the same time, it is very important to have some political decisions, actions, because if you want to change some rules, you need to change them now. You need to uh, have some resources to change it and you need to have some technical uh, decisions how to change it. So um, I would say that in different countries, it is different uh, success. Uh, on this, uh, for example, uh, we have uh, some representative from France. I think they can comment on this, but maybe you've been observed how uh, France just decided to stop uh, after the first round of elections because of the uh, very low level of uh, turnover uh, voters. And that's why they decided not to continue with the election uh, campaign, uh, not campaign, sorry, with the voting procedures. So it is uh, a very technical issue, but very important to have trustworthy decision and to have trustworthy results. Um, the second one, of course, it is about campaigning. Um, just we've been talking a lot and we've been uh, discussing a lot that people, they feel main, mainly frustration, uncertainty, and of course, fear. And that's why uh, in many countries, what we are observing now, we're observing the lowest 
historical level of trust to the uh, authorities, to, to politicians, even to institutions such as healthcare system. So uh, my feeling that uh, campaigning is going to be uh, very uh, challengeable, first of all, because it's very hard to propose something uh, to the citizens who don't believe uh, in state, who don't believe in institutions, who don't believe in efficiency of politicians. And the second one, because of uh, a lot of limitations, uh, it is very hard really to approach them, to campaign, uh, to involve them physically in uh, campaigning. And uh, uh, it is very important thing when you don't have supporters, when you don't have people who are helping you with campaigning, who are like uh, promoting you and just coping with many organizational issues, especially in big countries, for example, like mine, uh, where we have like 42 million people. Uh, it is very hard especially for new political party without uh, oligarchic resources or with huge fun funds uh, really to cope with this. That's why I think that the main trend of the new campaigning will be uh, digital platforms. So it will be internet parties, uh, it will be digital involvement, different initiatives and other things. And of course, uh, who is going to be the best one in this? Uh, this people can be not maybe elected uh, for 100% or for sure, but definitely they will be uh, one of the leaders during the campaign. And um, additionally, I want to cover one more thing um, about agenda, political agenda. Uh, Hula mentioned that he afraid. Uh, populism and he afraid uh, uh, restrictions and even maybe uh, moving towards um, uh, some kind of uh, uh, undemocratic trends. I would say it, uh, that I, I, I would support the idea of populism, but also I would support the idea, or it is my uh, point of view, that people that are going to vote either for those politicians who are going to uh, present, uh, yes, very practical uh, decisions, but with understanding of resources and how to uh, uh, make these decisions on, from the practical point of view. And the second one, they are not going to uh, vote because of uh, promises. And I don't think that it is, it is going to be, it is going to be campaign with emotional, uh, substance because mainly people they became very rational yes they feel fear they feel uncertainty but at the same time they're very rational they feel like guys now we we don't think that you, you cope with the pandemic uh, threaten we don't uh, we don't understand why we are paying taxes why we are paying our bills and why we are paying uh, for medical uh, care and then it is collapse. Everything is like uh, everything collapsed, and uh, you can't provide official services, especially uh, governmental services. And I think that people they feel so frustrated that they are not going to follow any emotional um, statement. They will follow very rational, very pragmatic, and realistic programs. And also um, this uh, few like uh, this uh, very. Uh, I would say up to date agenda just three uh, months ago, for example, ecology and uh, climate change. Now, this agenda there even more threatened because uh, of economic crisis. Many productions they are not going to follow uh, the special policies, you know, to cope with climate changes. They just need to recover. That's why politicians will have one more challenge: how to balance. A recovering of the economy and at the same time how to balance challenges that we still have globally like uh, climate change. So my uh, last um, point, it is a point about uh, uh, changes in uh, um, behavior of citizens. I think that they don't trust states anymore. They don't trust uh, institutions and what I can observe from Ukrainian experience uh, our volunteers, they've been more effective during COVID crisis than uh, governmental services. 
our uh, local authorities, they've been more effective and they could cope better with uh, all the challenges than uh, uh, government or central uh, authorities. It means that power and uh, expectation of citizens, citizen, they're going to uh, move, I would say, they're going to move to local authorities to local initiatives. And I think because people, they felt like, okay, guys, we sacrifice with our um, freedom. Uh, we, we gave uh, state uh, or government some control over our lives, but didn't get security. So now we are going to cope with this uh, by ourselves. That's why I expect more mobilization from uh, citizens point of view from uh, uh, or just maybe some um, very uh, low level I mean low level uh, initiatives from the local point of view and I expect that uh, people they are going to be more involved in politics and politics is going to change next uh, one or two years. Elena thank you ever so much and it's wonderful to see you and I'm really looking forward to following your campaign. The next speaker is Jake Sullivan. Now, Jake is the former National Security Advisor to US Vice President Joe Biden and Director of Policy Planning at the US State Department, as well as Deputy Chief of Staff to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. He was the Senior Policy Advisor on Secretary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign. And previously, he served as Deputy Policy Director on Clinton's 2008 presidential primary campaign, and also as a member of the debate preparation team for Barack Obama's general election campaign. And Sullivan also previously served as a Senior Policy Advisor and Chief Counsel to Senator Amy Klobuchar from his home state of Minnesota. Jake, we're delighted to have you. Thanks, Emma. Can you hear me? Oh, you got a beard. Uh, kind of. I'm, I'm, <laughs> trying to, I'm trying to grow one in, in our continued stay at home situation here, but this is the best I can do. So I'm going to keep at it. Um, thank, you for, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you to everybody. Elena, it was great to get to listen to you and, and Julio as well. Um, I'm the non-politician of the group, the political advisor, someone who has worked on a number of political campaigns, both at the presidential level and at the Senate level in the U.S. And uh, I'm currently in a volunteer capacity spending a fair amount of my time um, advising Vice President Biden. Um, although speaking to you all today, I'm just speaking to you in, in my personal capacity, giving you my perspective on where things stand from an American point of view on uh, politics in the COVID era. And really, just so we can get into a good discussion, and because frankly, I can't compete with either Elena or Julio uh, um, with, for their wisdom and insight, I'm just going to make a few very brief points, and then I'd be happy to uh, sit back and listen and, and answer any questions that, that people might have. So the first point that I would make is that um, the, uh, the pandemic has less created an entirely new set of political dynamics and more accelerated existing political dynamics to the point where it's not just a difference in degree, it's a difference in kind. And, and a, a big example of that is the centrality of the question of domestic production, domestic manufacturing capacity when it comes to critical medical supplies and equipment and, and other national security items. Uh, here in the United States, there is a view that we can never again be subject to the need to import masks or ventilators or other critical supplies in any kind of national security emergency, whether it's related to pandemics or to climate or to um, something more uh, in the more traditional hard national security space. And so the politics around reshoring, around bringing back supply chains, um, I think is very much alive in the American political context today. And I don't think that's unique to the United States. Uh, 
people in the U.S. are also seeing uh, Merkel and Macron uh, talk about these issues, uh, talk about buy European and procurement and the like. And I think that trend, which was already underway of some reduction in overall global trade flows, um, some greater desire for self-sufficiency and resilience, uh, domestic resilience, I think has accelerated and now just has a different flavor or character to it uh, as, we, as we look ahead. Second issue from the U.S. perspective is the U.S.-China relationship. Um, China and, and the issue of U.S. policy towards China has factored into presidential campaigns going back decades, but I think uh, it will factor into this one in a fundamentally different way. The Trump campaign has very explicitly signaled that it is going to make a central argument of its campaign that Joe Biden is weak on China and Donald Trump is strong on China. Uh, in fact, they've come up with this hashtag Beijing Biden as, as an effort to try and drum up this line of thinking. And the Biden campaign has made very clear that they're not just going to respond, but they're gonna go on offense in calling out uh, the Trump administration for its failures to hold China accountable on COVID, for its failures to actually produce a phase one trade deal that works, for its failures to deal with a number of the other uh, challenges that the United States has with aspects of China, uh, Chinese government policy and behavior. Um, so that's gonna be a big factor in this election in a way that is more acute and more center stage than it has been in the, in, in the past. The third um, major dimension, I think, that COVID has accelerated, it hasn't created out of thin air, but accelerated, is a general move in the center of gravity of American politics about the relationship between the government and the market. Um, even before COVID, if you went back to 2016, uh, there was a growing willingness of Americans to say, government should be playing a larger role in the provision of a social safety net, in public investment to drive job creation and job growth, uh, and in regulation to do things like reduce the overall amount of corporate concentration. And this was not just true among Democrats. Uh, these are ideas that are being put forward by some of the younger Republicans as well, like Senator Marco Rubio from Florida and Senator Josh Hawley from Missouri. Uh, and I think COVID will only accelerate this. It will accelerate an argument that says, these frontline workers who are out there keeping the economy running while so many of us were at our homes, they deserve the social safety net that has eluded them for a long time. And at a moment when Amazon is gobbling up market share from small businesses, I think you're increasingly gonna see an argument about anti-monopoly and antitrust protection. Uh, and in a moment when 20 plus million Americans are unemployed and the number is likely to rise in the next few weeks, um, the argument that the government should be deeply involved in massive public investments that will spur not just direct job creation, but job growth over time is going to grow as well. So these are real changes in the, in the kind of contours of the American political debate. The U.S. has always been a bit different from other democracies around the world in respect to the rather laissez-faire approach to the market and the more distant relationship of government to that market. And I think that tide, which came in with Ronald Reagan in 1980, is, is going out. Uh, it, it started going out after the global financial crisis, but I think COVID has, has dramatically accelerated that. So those are three big changes. And then the, the, just the final point I'll add before turning it back over to Emma and Nizam is, um, you know, those are substantive issues. That's the backdrop of the debate that's going to happen between Donald Trump and Joe Biden over the course of the rest of this year. But of course, there's also a practical dimension to campaigning, which is very challenging. And that is, uh, Joe Biden lives in Delaware. And currently in Delaware, uh, you're not allowed to have gatherings of more than 10 people, meaning that he can't summon the press corps um, for a press conference uh, in the same way, for example, that um, that uh, the White House can do. And so there are practical challenges with um, trying to campaign in a virtual era that the vice president has had to come up with a series of different creative techniques to try to reach voters where they are. For example, just today, he is quote unquote visiting Wisconsin, meaning he's spending his day 
as though he were on the ground in Wisconsin doing roundtables with farmers and small business owners, doing local media, doing conversations with local stakeholders. But that's all being done from his home in Delaware. And uh, that's a, going to um, evolve over the course of the next few months, but uh, is going to remain a fundamental challenge with respect to both President Trump, who's having to take all kinds of different precautions and can't do the big rallies that he's used to, and Vice President Biden. And of course, that brings us finally to the voting issue where the U.S. is having to conduct these elections, uh, potentially in the context of a, of a second wave of the virus. And so there are real questions about whether the U.S. election system will be prepared for that, which uh, we could potentially get into, but I'm going to leave it there and uh, turn it back over and just uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Jake, thank you so much. I'm um, just going to invite Elena and Julio to to rejoin us as we go into this Q&A um, segment. We've heard three fantastic speakers with three uh, in, insightful remarks about country context as well as much wider, deeper uh, issues and philosophies about a changing world post-COVID. Um, and we've got some questions coming through, so I'd love for you to keep um, sending them through. My first question to get us started is around um, compromise, I guess. So I, I think everyone uh, on the panel has strong principles and, and values. H how willing are you to compromise in terms of what you stand for? Because you can't ultimately make change until you have power. Um, and, and Julio, if I can come to you, you mentioned in, in Peru, uh, you mentioned uh, the struggles of populism and rising populism. Uh, so how, how, how can you meet pe people where they are in terms of the way they've been conditioned and the way they're likely to vote? Um, how does that thought process and balance um, figure in terms of your own thinking? Well, first of all, uh, thinking that you don't need to be empowered to start making changes. And one of the things that we are doing, for instance, is that we're putting our organization in a, to the population. We are not doing this publicly because we don't want to gain any political uh, uh, favor. But uh, one of the things that we can do is to, to tell people that political parties are not only for running elections that get to the power, but also they can use their organization in a very practical way to channel all the help that we can do to the population. But the second one, which is more strategic, is that if we really want to make change and if we really want to confront a completely new scenario, we need to be prepared. One of the things that happen in Latin America is that there is no planning, not only no planning in, in economic terms, but also in political terms. What we are doing now is that we are working really hard, creating the conditions, the, the organizational conditions, and also the ideas in order to be ready to tell Peruvians uh, what we should do in the, in the future. Of course, this needs um, a compromise in the population. Um, but I believe that this compromise needs to be correlated and needs to be in parallel with the political message. Uh, the Peruvians are not going to think immediately, you know, overnight, oh, I need to compromise. This is the role of leaders, to tell people that if we want to achieve well-being, we need to change how we think. And from there, we can make better uh, public policies. Julio, thank you so much. Elena, your thoughts on, on the question of compromise and, and power? Uh, it's a great question and I would say a difficult one. I, I had a lot of time you know, to observe and to analyze uh, one and the main uh, issue for me why many countries and many states couldn't cope effectively with the challenge. And uh, what would I do if I've been on their place, you know? And sometimes uh, it is very hard to find this answer. And mainly what I had, for, I had opportunity for the last six months is to realize that, yes, I have my values, I have my principles, and I have my beliefs, which I can fight for and I can stand for, but the real life of many people in my country, even I would say of majority of, of my country, is much uh, worse than my life. 
So we are living in a different uh, circumstances, in a different conditions. I am living, uh, living in the capital of the city. I had ch chance to uh, just to grow, to develop, to have great ca career. And many Ukrainians, they didn't have this chance and they won't have this ch chance next 10 or 15 years. That's why, why sometimes you need to look not just on yourself, but to look of what is happening with the majority of the citizens and what is the real uh, challenges for them each day, uh, each, each uh, day and uh, in their just ordinary life. And I would say that I'm on this stage that I'm ready to compromise with my understanding in order to uh, have this bigger view and helicopter view of what is happening with my citizens and what is their problems. Elena, thank you. And, and Jake, if I can come to you with that question and, I, and, I, and I'll add something else here. We've had a question from Stephen here, uh, one of our attendees. You mentioned the trend of countries becoming more self-sufficient. So by way of compromise, do you think this will make the US less of a world leader and perhaps allow China to fill this role instead? And just if I may, there's another question from Milan also around China specifically, um, but given that it will be an important campaign issue, will decoupling the US economy become more than a talking point? Um, so I'll start with the second question first, although the two questions are related. I think broad decoupling, the idea that the US and China are going to separate their economies entirely is, is an implausible proposition, given how deep uh, the integration is across such a wide range of sectors and how some substantial degree of economic interchange between the U.S. and China, if done right, uh, can benefit both countries. Um, but I do think there will be a trend towards some amount of deintegration, particularly in technology, but also on certain supply chains that are critical to national security. I mean, I mentioned medical supplies and equipment. Uh, you, you could imagine um, pharmaceutical ingredients. Uh, you could imagine other potential types of uh, technologies that have military applications. So I think there will be a greater trend towards restrictionism, both of inbound investment on both sides and of export controls on both sides and a rerouting of, of the supply chain system more broadly. That will not be comprehensive. That will not be across the board but that will take place in a number of areas. I think that's already begun to uh, get underway and I think it would continue regardless of who's elected president next year. Uh, and in fact, many in the American private sector uh, are now openly supportive of uh, increased restrictionism in some ways where they used to be really big cheerleaders for just deeper and deeper integration. On the question of whether a drive for more national self-reliance reduces um, the potential for U.S. leadership in the world. I, I don't think there is anything inconsistent with wanting to say there are certain key domains in which you want to have the capacity to, to build things at home and also say we're all in the same boat and we all got to work together on these big global challenges. And I think the big difference between Donald Trump and Joe Biden is that Donald Trump basically believes that self-reliance means withdrawal from international institutions, withdrawal from alliances, withdrawal from a sense of meaningful participation in or leadership of key organizations, whereas Joe Biden believes exactly the opposite. He would pair a strategy of, of bringing jobs back to the United States with a strategy of deep international engagement and American leadership in global health and climate and nuclear proliferation uh, and international economic and financial policy. Not exactly as it's always been, it'll be different because the world's different, um, but uh, a role for the United States to mobilize and drive international cooperation across a range of issues that cannot be solved by any one country acting alone. And then finally on China, there is something kind of richly ironic about Xi Jinping showing up at Davos and saying, I'm now the champion of the liberal international economic order given the way that China fundamentally looks out for itself in terms of domestic production, procurement, state-owned enterprises and the like. Um, and something richly ironic about China showing up at the WHO and saying, we're the great global leader on global health when 
their record, particularly in respect to this pandemic, has been so shoddy. So I think a lot of that has to do with U.S. absence um, and China's filling a vacuum um, that uh, you'd, you'd see a lot more uh, pushback against um, in some of these areas if you had an American president who was prepared to step up and play not the same role as the U.S. in the 90s or the 2000s uh, because the world is different, but nonetheless an, an important role going forward. Jake, thank you so much. And we've had a couple of questions of the theme going here around trust. So we have Ahmed al-Bashir um, from Iraq, um, who is asking the question, what if the people don't trust? And I think trust is a word that Elena has raised and Julio, you've raised, um, the new ways of elections and the percentage of people who vote. So I think in the context of, I think if the vote was less than 25%. So how are you building uh, trust in, in this world, in this new world where, as has rightly been said, um, people are seeing things differently? And I think there's a question here um, if I may, um, around um, corruption um, and how do we get rid of corruption? This is from Korali uh, for Julio. So Julio, we'll start with you. Peruvians have seen this a lot in terms of corruption. It's frustrating that it's corruption. Getting rid of corruption will be important and is key in Rusa in the country and it's part of democracy. So how do you fight corruption and rebuild trust in a post-COVID world? Well, first of all, it's going to be very challenging for two reasons. One is that campaigning is going to be very short. Uh, the next presidential elections are going to be held in April 2021. So we have a very short period of time in which we can show people how to trust us. But the second one is more a structural one, that Peru uh, has the, the, the less uh, trust capital in whole Latin America. And, and this is uh, because of uh, historical reasons is, is very difficult to, to promote collective action. So one of the things that, uh, that we are doing now is to build a narrative. I believe that people, even if they don't trust you, they're gonna trust about your story. And Partido Morado has been working for five consecutive years in a very consistent and current way. We have an opportunity now that we have nine congressmen uh, in Congress, so we have a very nice uh, representation, and we are trying to channel that consistency and that uh, and those messages through uh, through Congress. Uh, it's been very difficult. I'm going to tell you that uh, most of the congressmen in Peru now are, are you know proposing a lot of populist uh, uh, things, but we are trying to be responsible, but at the same time caring about people. If you combine those things and you create a narrative. Uh, uh, in a period of time, I believe that people would start you know, uh, uh, believing in you. But um, as I said, it's uh, very challenging because of the time and it's challenging because of the Peruvian culture. Julio, thank you. Elena, can we come to you to, to ask you about how do you build trust? Uh, uh, yes, I would say it's the main challenge now. Um, the first step, I think, to talk uh, more, I, I mean, like, to communicate uh, and to give more uh, information, reliable information. Just example from my country, for example, during the COVID, we didn't have really uh, reliable uh, data on how many people been affected because we didn't have too much tests. Uh, during this period of time and uh, many people believed and they still believe that we didn't have in reality a uh, pandemic uh, situation and everything was like more or less stable. The second one of course it is involvement in taking decision and especially because now we have tested many uh, things, tools, how to cooperate on distance, how to involve people. I think it is uh, a very uh, right approach and uh, we should think about this. And the last one, uh, we, if we are talking about realistic change in a political agenda, what is going to happen in many countries, and they already decided about this, that they're going to protect their uh, production, they're going to protect their companies, they're going to think more uh, domestically than globally. And mainly uh, switching uh, to uh, protectionism and switching to this uh, local uh, agenda, as I mentioned before, is going to be the uh, main thing. Also, 
uh, as a, an experiment, I think Ahmed can uh, really like this. I want you to remind that during um, uh, ancient times, especially Athenian democracy, there is a democracy when you pick up uh, uh, the decision and you're, you're choosing a candidate just uh, by, by chance, you know, like uh, taking the matches, which one is the shortest, this one is going to be the president. So maybe someday we, we are going to switch to this uh, system, <laughs> but in, in a more uh, developed way. I'm not joking because you can look, uh, there is uh, Arthur Fishkin, he is from, uh, I think he is Dutch um, uh, scientist, and he proposed more uh, developed system for uh, this uh, modern times. Elena, thank you. Jake, I'm going to come to you with slightly different. So on the issue of trust, you've already mentioned um, uh, politicians needing to go online, um, especially in a COVID world where we're in lockdown. Michelle Rentner from the Netherlands has a question. Um, will COVID educate older political candidates more quickly in the use of social media for campaigning purposes? Um, because they'll obviously have no other ways to reach. And I think what's interesting for me is the second part of this question. And will campaigning in COVID times because um, you have to be far more punchier and, and less reliant on personality, will it promote a more populist message? Um, and then, and, then and, and the third part of the question, which came from, and I want to make sure I get this right, from Stephen, is can that be manipulated by, as we know, state actors from around the world who may be interested in sabotaging elections? It's a, th th those are great questions. Uh, on the first one, yes, I do think, um, you know, uh, candidates who didn't grow up with social media, who grew up in a different era, uh, including Vice President Biden, Donald Trump, um, the need to communicate through the medium of Zoom or, uh, you know, by iPhone um, has meant, has been a kind of uh, quick lesson in um, kind of how information is conveyed and received through social media and online. And I think the vice president just in the last two months has a different understanding and appreciation um, of this. And it's allowed for greater creativity in, in setting up conversations with nurses who are on the front lines or with, uh, you know, farmers who are, you know, trying to get food to feed hungry people with food lines stretching for miles in some U.S. cities. So he's, been able to participate. Just last night, for example, he did this event um, through Yahoo with Jose Andres, the, the chef. And mm -hmm. um, two months ago, I think it would have had a little bit more of a feeling of formality or distance to it. But after spending two months essentially living on Zoom, the vice president and, and chef Andres had this very kind of easy rapport. It just had a different feel to it. And I think that's a good concrete example of how it's changed. In terms of um, whether it's gonna drive more populism, you know, I actually think that because so much of, social, of, of politics was already consumed through social media, even before COVID times, um, that like this trend was heading in a populist direction, who gets more clicks is kind of who's being a bit more bombastic, who's being more simple in their messaging, who's calling for the bigger, bolder thing, who can generate memes. I think politics was already headed that way. And I do think that this campaign this year will only accelerate that. And then finally on, on um, potential for foreign interference, I think it's very real um, uh, uh, that, that it, it will be exacerbated through a campaign that is more online. One of the things I'm particularly concerned about is whether in this campaign or a, a near future campaign is the rise of deep fakes, um, which the more you look into, the more you realize uh, this is a scary proposition that you could, you know, have images of Joe Biden or Donald Trump saying stuff they never said flooding the internet and have very little uh, effective way to police it. So in terms of where the next turn of the crank may be in terms of state sponsored efforts to engage and undermine election integrity, that's one I very much worry about. Jake, thank you. And Julio, uh, if I can come to you to talk about the importance of digital strategy for you in terms of your campaign, how much of that has been expedited because of COVID? Excuse me? I didn't How hear. much of the digital campaigning has had to be expedited because of COVID? Yeah, the, the, the trend was already there in Peru 
but this is going to be accelerated because of, of uh, COVID. Now, 80% of the population in Peru has access to internet and Facebook and those kinds of things. So I believe that it's going to, uh, first, we need to be very innovative, creative, but I would like to take also uh, one idea that Jake uh, shared with us, that the fake news and all those kinds of things are going to be more important and going to be more decisive in what's going on in the campaign. But the challenge is how to reach the 20% of the population who are not connected to internet. And this is particularly important in Peru because we are a very diversified country. Our geography is, is, is uh, very complex. And that 20% of the population that are not connected to internet are exactly the same that need the most are exactly the same people who are the more vulnerable and need a state intervention. So um, uh, one of the things that, uh, that we are trying to do, that we are trying to do is uh, to use uh, uh, some kind of, uh, of centers and trying to, uh, to, to ask people to go to a very specific location to uh, start giving messages uh, through the internet. This is gonna be very uh, uh, challenging, but if we have uh, enough attention I believe that at least uh, some people will uh, agree to go to these places, to the, the nearest ones, in order to uh, be connected with, uh, uh, with the party and with the pol uh, political messages. But still, I don't have a, a final answer because it's gonna be very challenging to, uh, to reach that uh, fraction of the population in Peru. Julio, thank you. Elaine, I'm gonna come to you to answer that question. I'm very conscious of time. We are actually over and I wanna make sure you guys who have plans uh, are able to run off. So I'm gonna ask the final question and I'm gonna ask you all to answer this final question. And Lane, if you can wrap up the digital. And before I do, I wanna just say thank you to, to Claudia, to Raul, to Stephen, to Corali, to Wallace, um, Cristobal, uh, Ayodele, Raul again, and also Kofi for your questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to answer it in this session. I hope we can later. So in this period of COVID and in a period of crisis, there is an opportunity. And I'm keen to hear from you what has been, what, what do you think is the biggest opportunity for elections uh, and, and to maximize elections in a post-COVID world? What is giving you hope, I guess, in a post-COVID world to build in the good society? So Elena, if we can go to you okay. first on that. I, I will try to be very uh, short. So about digitalization, I believe that it is going to be digital mobilization of uh, uh, civil society and many active people. And just my message uh, for citizens, if they don't care about the politics, politics definitely is going to care about them, but without their opinion. So definitely they should be active. And about opportunities, you know, I think that COVID naked uh, many problems and uh, it helps us to find the solution how to cope this, for, with these problems for the better future of people. Thank you, Irene. And Jake, what gives you hope in terms of elections in a COVID world or a post-COVID world? Boy, I'm in a pretty dark place right now, <laughs> but I know we're all trying to build the good society. We are. Um, no, honestly, what gives me hope here, at least in the United States, is that I think that COVID-19 has shined a bright light on some fundamental structural flaws in the U.S. social contract, in the way that we treat our workers, uh, and in the racial disparities in our healthcare system and access to capital as part of the recovery. And I, I actually have some faith that now that that light has been shown, it is going to be harder for the forces that have mustered to resist real progressive change to be able to sustain that resistance. Uh, and so that gives me hope. Keep that flame burning, Jake. And Julio, the last word to you. Yes. Well, my hope is that uh, people are going to realize that a state intervention is good. And that's very important <laughs> in Latin America because there is a taboo. There is a taboo for decades that the state shouldn't be intervening the markets and that's wrong. A state should be present. And because of COVID, my hope is that most people could finally understand that the state could be the solution, but not giving you a welfare state, not giving you social safety nets for all or many you know, benefits or social benefits, that's okay. But the most important thing about uh, the new uh, approach of the state 
is to create an opportunity state, which is different than the welfare state. The opportunity state is the one that gives you good education, health, opportunities for small and medium uh, um, um, companies, but in a universal way, no targeting, but for all the population to get access. So that's my, that's my hope, that people start believing in institutions, in inclusive institutions, and also believing that the state could be the solution if, they, if it intervened well in markets, uh, as, I, as I said. Julio, Jake, Elena, thank you so much for your time, for your contributions. You have a big year ahead of you. We are with you in building the good society and wish you all the luck. Emma. So thank you very much to our panelists and also to the audience for those great questions. And I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. But please join us again, same time on Sunday, when we're going to be discussing the opportunities to create solidarity and mobilize constituencies in the face of climate change. Thank Bye. You.